Well, the key to it in a way is in fact the old history of the Central African Republic's relationship with France. Um, it was a French colony and after independence, many of the former French colonies in Africa maintained quite close relations with France um, uh, with a currency partnership, for example, and the Central African Republic was one of those. And it was a country where French post-colonial influence in those early decades after independence was particularly strong. The French were very often involved. Um, they were accused sometimes of even being involved in the removal or installation of governments. Now, that was really in that those three decades, four decades from 1960, the year of independence onwards. But as France sought to reform and modernize its policy and step back from that situation, really from the 1990s onwards, um, this left a bit of a space. Now, partly uh, that into that space stepped instability, if you like, because the French had long maintained a military presence in the CAR. And when they reduced and eventually wound up that military presence, uh, this is a this is a very country with a very large land area, but a very small population and a very, very fragile state. And really, since that time, since the 1990s, the country has been plagued by instability, um, uh, recurrent rebellions, um, and uh, governments that have really struggled to do, apply the authority. They haven't been, they haven't necessarily, they haven't really been dictatorial. Occasionally there have been dictatorial governments, but that's further back in the past. More of these governments have simply struggled to apply effectively the authority of the state in a constitutional and organized way, delivering public services everywhere and security everywhere. And so um, that's left a vacuum. And when Tuadera became president, he was uh, faced with a situation where the main security presence in the CAR was actually provided by the UN peacekeeping force. And as he sought to gradually uh, rebuild the CAR's military strength, the, rebuild its basic security forces, he wanted to buy um, weapons for the armed forces. But because of the history of instability around the 2013 Seleka rebellion and uh, a counter rebellion against it, which had been by Christian militia, the anti-Balaka, and the, the, the country had skated close to the edge of genocide. There had been sectarian killings. It had been a very dangerous situation. It was subjected to an arms embargo, and uh, there had been evidence of um, human rights violations by elements of the national armed forces, which had even reinforced, if you like, the determination of the international community to remain maintain an embargo. So Tuadera was seeking to rebuild the country's armed forces, but he had to get around the embargo. And so there were there was discussion with international partners. And in fact, the French were willing to supply some weapons, but very carefully because of this situation. Um, and in fact, the Russians proved quicker on the draw. And one might say, what is Russia's motivation? But um, if you look at uh, President Putin's policy around the world, quite often he likes to, um, as it were, deploy a Russian presence that will irritate uh, traditional Western partners in areas where they have had the predominant influence. So in this case, this was like a, a, a way of ruffling the feathers of France, a way of um, showing that Russia is still a player on the international scene that counts, that can exercise some influence um, in an area where uh, France had been traditionally predominant. And that's really the context so the Russian presence is entirely legitimate. It's within the uh, legal framework, the CAR, 
despite being a very fragile country, of course, with the UN keep peacekeeping force, it is a sovereign state. Tuadera has been the elected president and he has had the right, therefore, to make agreements, those agreements that he feels are appropriate. The arms embargo was eventually relaxed on terms which allowed him to um, secure supplies from Russia and the Russian military company Wagner, which is uh, believed to have quite close links to the Kremlin, uh, sent troops to um, the CAR. And that was uh, entirely within, if you like, the, the legal framework of how the Central African state can function. Um, at an, and it isn't, it isn't the first time that an outside player has been brought in. At one point when Bozizé was president, uh, before his downfall in 2013, he had a relationship, defense relationship with South Africa, and there were South African troops in the CAR, and much speculation that that related to political vested economic interests in South Africa who might be interested in the CAR's mineral resources. Um, but that ended in a disastrous defeat for the South African contingent uh, have left and of course now South Africa has a different government anyway um, but Russia has sort of stepped into the breach um, other international players they remain very influential though although the Russians have soldiers on the ground there are also some French soldiers um, bec because there's this European Union and uh, a training mission and a UN mission in the CAR and of course, the US is not so much a military partner, but it's standing behind the international system, if you like. So one of the notable features uh, of, the, of the international statement last week issued by the G5 plus is how many international actors are involved in that group. And that's a sign, if you like, that basically the international community broadly has a strong interest in the CAR being stabilized. Um, it isn't a crisis that has huge implications for um, the whole of the rest of Africa or um, concern about jihadist terrorism or whatever at this stage, at least. But even so, the international community has invested very heavily in stabilizing uh, the CAR and trying to establish a measure of security. Thank you for this great and insightful breakdown. So, Paul, I'm just going to ask you one last question, and you've kind of given an extended version of this question throughout the interview. But if you just had to sum up the last five, ten years of the Central African Republic and the current issues and which regions perhaps are creating the most problems, if you just had to sum it up in one answer, what would you say? I suppose the, the shorthand situation is that in the aftermath of the Seleka rebellion, so the 2013 rebellion, and the gradual restoration of order after that, the challenges, the greatest security challenges, um, there were some close to Bangui, but they were largely, it's been a process of slowly restoring the authority of the state to the north and the east, particularly the north of the country, which was where Seleka had sprung from. And that process is not yet fully complete. But um, what the events of the last two weeks have shown is that uh, there's also still serious potential for instability and insecurity in the West. And that's uh, quite an economically valuable region. Um, it has relatively more people in it. It has a important for the production of cotton. And of course, it's the region through which the CAR's main connection to the outside world, uh, the the road to the border with Cameroon uh, runs. So um, it's insecurity in that region is going to pose whatever the outcome of the election, that's going to be a big challenge. And it's going, the, the events of the last two weeks show that even when apparent progress has been made, um, well, real progress has been made, there is still an awful lot of fragility. It's going to be a very slow and gradual process. Um, however, the election pans out eventually to restore basic peace and stability so that those basic government services can be provided and um, 
the focus can shift towards uh, development, uh, poverty reduction, the creation of jobs, the restoration of uh, um, trade. Uh, that that's going to be going to be a very slow and gradual process.